Now I'd like to turn our attention to Shona Wilson, who's an associate professor of art history at the College of Staten Island and the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Shona's research interests are grounded in issues of sexual difference and the intersection of art and politics in post-war and contemporary art. She has published widely on topics including feminist politics of war imaging, photography, video art, and experimental film, and she's also a contributing writer for Art Review. But today, her paper will examine Wolf's 1938 pacifist treatise, Three Guineas, as an important, largely overlooked photo book within the context of British photography and national identity. Please welcome Shona. I feel like I'm going to spill this, so I'm going to take my, uh, my free water. <laughs> uh, thank you, and let me echo everybody else um, and thank uh, Martina and all the organizers of the event, which has been going so well so far. Um, okay. In 1991, to mark the 50th anniversary of Virginia Woolf's death, Random House reissued her non-fiction, including the 1938 book Three Guineas. An unsigned internal memo from the uh, press's archives describes the marketing challenges in the following terms. The real need is to reclaim Virginia Woolf from the cultural artifact she has become, the chili hypersensitive grand arm at the center of an elitist and incestuous circle, an image that she would be the first to deprecate and ridicule. The memo goes on to ask, why is she so famous in America and throughout the world, but relatively disregarded in this country? More than any other text by Wolf Three Guineas challenges this particularly British reception of her as a literary personality. As Wolfe's second major book-length feminist statement, Three Guineas offers a complex, and to many in her day, shocking analysis of the link between women's exclusion from the institutional apparatus of the patriarchal nation state and the spectre of fascist militarism in Europe. This complex anti-war statement is also a radical challenge to the benevolent civilizational logic of other members of the Bloomsbury's, most notably her husband, Leonard Wolfe, as expressed in his 1935 book, Quack, Quack. She does this through a written reflection on documentary photographs of war victims while showing a different selection of newspaper photographs that reference sovereign power. These are three of the five illustrations. Three Guineas was written um, during a period that saw the emergence and widespread proliferation of both documentary photography and the mass media image. This conjunction indexes a major social transformation that John Tagg has argued for Britain and the United States is bound up with the consolidation of the citizen's subject within an expanded field of state power. If the 19th century saw photography put to work as document, by various um, state and extra state institutions, police archives, ethnographic compendia, for example. The conceptualis conceptualization and proliferation of documentary in the 1930s is the affective extension of these earlier disciplinary modes. Documentary serves, he argues, as the linkage between the thought and feeling of the subject as citizen and the state. Well, this framing of the citizen subject is conceived in gender neutral terms. One of the central questions in Three Guineas is women's failure to fully participate in the institutions of the state. In the years after attaining the vote, Wolf lays out the extent to which women continue to fall short of achieving full status as citizens. She meticulously charts women's impoverished participation in the institutions of education, the labor market, the military, the government, religion, and the family. Three Guineas pro provides a systemic argument for women's status as, and this is Wolf's term, outsiders to the nation itself. Despite Wolf's very different reception in the US, it's here, however, that Three Guineas has been most consistently published in an incomplete or doctored form. Wolf's argument about documentary photography is obscured by the erasure of the actual printed photographs, 
which is also an erasure of three guineas as a photo book, the final two images. <clears throat> the book's argument is all the more complex because of its fictionalized epistolary form. There are 12 letters in total, some incomplete, others received, and three sent with a charitable donation of a guinea included. The narrator, an unnamed woman, responds after a delay of three years to a letter from a middle-aged barrister, male barrister, and representative of a peace organization. He poses the following question. How, in your opinion, are we to prevent war? If, within the fictionalized structure of the book, the original letter arrived three years previously in 1935, this was the year that the pacifist wing of the Labour Party was definitively defeated at the conference in Brighton. 1936 saw the, fasc the fascist supported military coup in Spain, which led to the Spanish Civil War. Wolf's nephew, Julian Bell, was among the many, many volunteers who left to fight on the Republican side, and in 1937, he was killed in action. The narrator first responds to the man's question by noting the vast difference, a gender difference, that marks the intellectual authority of the two letter writers of him and her. She immediately frames it in terms of the problem of women's education. From this central spine of gendered learning, Wolf sets forth a bone structure of politics and its representational form, the press, pro property, work, or specifically middle-class women's limited access to the professions, of liberty, freedom, and empire as the, central, as the necessary com components for fleshing out her answer. Because of women's uh, educational inequality, she tells her male counterpart, though we look at the same things, we see them differently. This problem of vision, of a socially inscribed difference in vision, of how and from where one sees, is soon connected to other kinds of pictures. The third letter that, that, that appears in Three Guineas, mentioned very early on in the book, is from the Spanish government. It is said, to include a series of photographs. After this, shorthand fragments of Wolf's initial description of these photographs recur periodically throughout the book. As I quote this initial passage on the unseen Spanish photographs, take note that every sentence is structured didactically. They are not, present, they are not ple pleasant photographs to look upon. They're photographs of dead bodies for the most part. This morning's collection contains the photograph of what might be a man's body or a woman's. It is so mutilated that it might be, that it might, on the other hand, be the body of a pig. But those certainly are dead children, and that, undoubtedly, is a section of a house. Without ever showing any such image, Wolf nonetheless makes a documentary gesture. They, this, those, that, and there are all shifters. Like photography, didactic words or shifters are indexical signs. They point to the referent and require context to secure meaning. Wolf uses language to perform this documentary gesture and purposefully keeps the Spanish photographs out of sight. There are, however, five other photographs, which we've just seen, um, printed in the pages of the book. But these Spanish photographs, this particular documentary image, is never seen. Instead, the photographs that Wolf uses to illustrate Three Guineas lack the dramatic quality of the memorable press image or the modernist style associated with documentary photographers of the 1930s. And I'm, um, I'm sure all of you recognize the left image as coming from um, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, uh, uh, and it's a photograph by Walker Evans. And I'm using it um, because I think it's the most comparable photo book with its relatively uh, uh, long text and relatively few images. So Wolf's uh, photographic ready-mades taken from the press show a series of archaic types in highly coded elaborate costumes, signifiers of the pre-modern that rule the modern capitalist nation state. Although for are well-known figures of the day. These photographs are not presented as images of named individuals. Instead, they point elsewhere to the sexually differentiated state. 
These photographic illustrations are indirectly introduced into the text through another reflection on seeing differently. Moreover, at this point, Wolf further fleshes out the idea of a gender differentiated vision, but now she uses the photograph as a metaphor for social exclusion. And I quote, let us by way of a very elementary beginning lay before you a photograph, a crudely colored photograph of your world as it appears to us who see it from the threshold of the private house, through the shadow of the veil that St. Paul still lays upon, uh, over our eyes, uh, from the bridge that connects the private house with the public world. Your world then, the world of professional, of public life seen from this angle, undoubtedly looks queer. The purported facticity of the photograph is further complicated or undermined by the various obstacles that impair women's full social existence. From fact to figure, the photograph has become a metaphor for the very social disparities that give shape to what we can see. Before turning the, the page to reveal the first image, um, a general, Wolf begins her textual description. <clears throat> the following passage touches on elements that appear in all of the images, a general, heralds, a university procession, a judge, an archbishop, spaced at regular intervals throughout the book. This description is also a kind of didactic demonstration of how such an, an image, a very conventional newspaper photograph of a military leader could in fact be seen differently. I quote, your clothes in the first place make us gape with astonishment. How many, how splendid, how extremely ornate they are. The clothes worn by the educated man in his public capacity. Now you dress in violet. In jeweled, a jeweled crucifix swings from your breast. Now your shoulders are covered with lace, now furred with ermine, now slung with many linked chains set with precious stones. Now you wear wigs on your head, rows of graduated curls descend your necks. Now your hats are boat shaped or cocked. Now they mount in cones of black fur. Now they are made of brass and scuttle shaped. Now plumes of red, now of blue hair surmount them. And she goes on. So this is just a short passage. An utterly banal newspaper illustration, the textual description make, makes us see it otherwise. A strange or even marvelous, an image filled with social meaning that we do not yet know. Like an amateur anthropologist or traveler charting the oddity of a foreign culture, in similar terms, Wolf goes on to describe various ceremonies of the state. The economic reference given in the title of Wolf's book alludes to the British Empire. The outmoded currency of the guinea, as Jane Marcus explains, points to the history of slavery on which Britain's wealth, including that of herself and of the women of her class, was built. Her title calls attention to the slave-based capitalism while to slave-based capitalism while reinforcing the connections between fascism and the patriarchal structure of British society. The relationship between wealth, empire, gender, and fascism are, are entwined in complicated patterns of complicity in Three Guineas. For example, <clears throat> women's status as outsiders to the nation is described as a form of slavery to the private house, but this is an enslavement that nonetheless bolsters up the system since consciously she must accept their views, that is, the busy men, the soldiers, the lawyers, the ambassadors, the cabinet ministers, the men she might or might seek to marry. All her conscious effort must be in favor of our splendid empire, while unconsciously she desires our splendid war. John Grierson developed his theories of documentary film while working for the Empire Marketing Board Film Committee. This governmental organization was charged during a period of economic crisis in the 30s with the circulation of food products and the promotion of empire. This is a shift, as Grierson writes, from the command of peoples to an apparently benign, if not Edenic, and I quote Grierson again, cooperative effort in the tilling of soil the reaping of har harvests, and the organization of world economy. Or put otherwise, a shift from the subjection to the photographic document of the 19th century to, as Bill Nichols has put it, documentary's rhetoric of social persuasion. While Leonard Wolf, in his 1935 book, Quack Quack, uses photography more straightforwardly through racist contrast, uh, to describe the ideological irrationalism and demagogic power of the fascist state. 
Um, and uh, I'm just showing you the cover on the left-hand side, but, and I apologize for um, um, not having the interior juxtapositions, but he juxtaposes images of Hitler with what are captioned as Hawaiian war guard. Um, the, these two, in fact, are juxtaposed and Mussolini with a similar image. In the text, he, ex he explicitly asserts a civilizational logic, contrasting ideas of the fascist and primitive savage tribes, his term, in the illustrations to the benevolent liberalism of civilized progress. Wolf's notion of seeing differently by contrast is applied solely to her own social class. It is also an act of self-othering, of non-understanding, because, because of the social disenfranchisement experienced by her sex. In this regard, Three Guineas might be aligned with mass observation, founded in 1937, but only, I think, in its uh, initial surrealist mode, and actually not uh, at all the documentary photographs uh, that Humphrey Spender took that have now become associated with this moment, but never were part of any publication, and at the time were not included in the archive, and they were only ever publicly shown in the late 1970s. Instead, I think, of um, the Day Diaries and the first two mass observation books, May the 12th, 1937, and Britain of 1939, which exemplify the group's plural, contested, subjective notion of observation. Like Wolf seeing differently, it's constitutively understood through the vectors of class, gender, and regional difference. It's a moment when the crisis in Europe demanded a new, a new kind of reflection on mass politics and national identification. Thank you. And now we'll take some questions. Um, I'll start with just one quick one. I, I just wondered, Shona, if you could talk a little bit about, um, a, a, a talk a little further about the sequencing of those five images within the text and the sort of circumstance behind excising them when they, uh, mm. when, when the next edition came over, when it came over to America. Uh, so the, the book is organized into three chapters and then there's a fourth uh, equivalent in length section of notes and references, which I wasn't able to talk about here, but uh, the photographs are, are, are presented um, in this sequence that I showed you in, mm -mm -mm. then like this, and they appear apparently randomly, there's no, except for the, the first uh, um, image of uh, a general um, with the section that I quoted for you, they appear without explicit reference. Mm -hmm. So there isn't this kind of connection established between text as caption or description and image as illustration. There's actually a kind of radical disjunction between the two forms. Um, and I suspect that's why um, Harper thought that, uh, Harcourt in America thought they could take the photographs out, and I also suspect it's, because many British editions as well uh, don't have the images, I also suspect that that's why they could be taken out. Um, but it's interesting because many Wolf scholars have, have looked into this, and um, Jane Marcus in particular, because um, the, I think there's a 2008 edition by Harcourt in the US, that's the US publisher, um, that includes the photographs, which is the first time since, I believe, since the first American edition in 38. And she spent her career as a Wolf scholar, and particularly as a Three Guineas scholar, trying to uh, um, persuade the press to reinsert the images. And she would be the expert and doesn't exactly know why. I've been raking through the press archives in the UK. Um, and also it's unclear. Um, there's something very, there's something very, um, um, I don't know, uh, uh, happy in some sense about them being removed because her circle and Quentin Bell in particular as well um, hated the use of the photographs. Mm -hmm. Male and female members of the Bloomsbury, they said they, they hated the photographs. They thought it was absurd and crass and um, insulting. Um, and I suspect that's because 
At this time, there's, this, there's a sort of attempt to establish a very clear distinction between uh, British politics and European fascism, which she is ex arguing directly against. So that's the sort of power of the Three Guineas. And in one sense, I think, you know, you can see it as a sort of feminist dialectic of enlightenment before its time. Uh, um, Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I was struck by your uh, a comparison between uh, Three Guineas and Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. And yeah. I was, uh, also, particularly the kind of materialist um, dimension of the kind of text image relationship. Mm. A.G. saying, if there could be no photographs, I would have just had scraps of cloth and wood. And Wolf's sort of description of this kind of material excess of um, of this kind of pageantry. But I wondered if you could comment on this question of seeing differently and whether in this work then, in the kind of political dimension, if Let Us Now Praise Famous Men is a kind of form of identification, right, um, through photography, yeah. is she proposing photography as a mode of disidentification? Mm -hmm. And how does that relate then to both how the photograph works, but also her kind of attention to the kind of materiality of, of the subjects of her photographs? Uh, yes, I'd say absolutely, yeah. Um, that, and you know, I think the thing, and this is hard, but I think the thing to remember is that, you know, this is a moment when the, the status of documentary was completely uh, unstable, and what it could do, what, what its sort of social purpose was, how, whether it achieved that kind of affective, uh, um, a, a, you know, address uh, whether it achieved the identification that you, you suggest, um, and so I think it, you know I'm trying to I'm trying to keep a kind of sense of uh, that historical instability in place because I think you know after uh, forty five there's a certain kind of um, with the images of the liberation of the the camps. There's a sort of, uh, and the formation of Magnum 47, et cetera, there's a kind of um, consolidation of what we think documentary is about, that it's about establishing the relationship between photography and history, that it is this kind of affective appeal, et cetera. And I think in 38, we don't really know. You know, it's, it, it's not in place yet. So I'm a little bit trying to operate within that you know, realm of it not being in place, but certainly I think that uh, w that Wolf is very much um, yes trying to use photography, both the images and then her description of these so-called Spanish photographs, which were saturating the press. You know, the the impact of the Spanish Civil War and the deluge of you know kind of um, refugees, good refugees, because they were children. Um, coming into Britain is such a kind of impact. It had such an impact in the late 30s, in the years before the war. And so I think that there's a certain, and those images were also had a certain sentimental uh, um, appeal. So I think that she's trying to get to something that is beneath the visual. So she uses these images um, that when um, David was talking, I was thinking, yes, they are kind of absurd. Um, but I also think that they wouldn't seem absurd in the 30s, they would seem utterly banal, utterly banal. And she makes them these material things through the text, not through their visual presence. So there's this kind of complex, but also complexly kind of disjunctive relationship between image and text that's not the, the relationship at all that we think of as being the photo books relationship, which is also not, let us now praise famous men, but other photo books where the text might function more as caption. But this is a really different kind of complex rhetorical relationship um, between these two things. I, I don't know whether that quite answers the question, but I threw some stuff at it. <laughs> um, I want to stop there um, because I want to make sure we have enough time for, for Lynn. And you'll have time for questions at the end, too. Thank you. Thank you, Shona. Thanks. Yeah.